Settle in to hear a story from long, long ago. The year was 2005, and the entire world was excited for the US Grand Prix weekend. But come Sunday, only six cars actually started the race. It was the most farcical, embarrassing race the modern sport had seen. So what actually happened? It was a tale of tyres, engineering, simulation, and politics. Held at a modified Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the US Grand Prix track was part oval, part twiddly infield. This gave the track a full throttle, heavily banked turn, the only corner of its type in the whole season. Unlike today, there was a development war raging between the sport's two tyre suppliers, Michelin and Bridgestone. Michelin supplied seven of the teams and Bridgestone three. Michelin in 2005 seemed to have the edge over their competitors, for the most part. There was also the unique for 2005 rule that banned mid-race tyre changes, so the life of a single set of tyres had to be managed across the entire length of the race. The potentially problematic nature of this rule had already been proved in Germany, where a flat-spotted tyre on Kimi Raikkonen's McLaren exacerbated over the race, to the point where it ripped his suspension apart on the last lap, costing him the win. The incident that kicked off the concern that culminated in the disastrous empty race started in free practice two, where Ralph Schumacher's rear left tyre failed through the full throttle banked final corner, sending him flying into the barrier at 175 miles an hour. It was a serious enough incident to sideline Ralph for the rest of the weekend. Ralph had already fractured his back last year in a similar spill into the same barrier. This promoted Toyota's third driver, Ricardo Zonta, to his race seat. But Zonta had also had a tyre failure in that same session, prickling Michelin's spidey senses. Something was wrong. Formula 1 doesn't tend to have high speed corners right up against solid barriers with zero runoff area. A tyre failure will slingshot a car out of its current velocity with little chance to slow down before impact. Any chance of an accident was very serious indeed, so any risks needed to be mitigated. Michelin set to work at getting to the bottom of these tyre failures, but by Saturday they still hadn't figured out confidently the cause of the failures. They even shipped in replacement tyres, but those tyres were a similar spec and would likely fail in the same way. As it stood, Michelin could not guarantee their cars could run safely for more than 10 laps, let alone the entire length of the race. It would later emerge that there were no fault in the Michelin tyres, they had been constructed exactly as Michelin had intended. The problem was that Turn 13 at Indianapolis placed uniquely extreme loads on the tyres that Michelin had underestimated in their simulations. Let's look at the unique challenge of that fast, banked turn. Bear in mind that Indianapolis was not a track reserved for test sessions, so most of the work done by Michelin had to come from data from previous races and a lot of simulator work. This wasn't strictly true of Bridgestone, who had tested the track several times over the last year through their American Firestone brand. In particular, they'd been able to gather data from the new resurfacing that had extra bearing on the tyre loads at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, as we shall see. So, through a normal corner, if a car wishes to steer to the right, the grippy tarmac resists and pulls the contact patch of the tyre left. This stretches the tyre wall somewhat through the outside length, working the rubber molecules. Repeated stretching and releasing weakens the rubber, and eventually, the rubber can start to tear, which quickly leads to failure the next time a high load is put through it. Understanding how much lateral load circuits are going to demand are a key part of manufacturing tyres to operate within those tolerances. Obviously, the very high speeds through turn 13 result in a higher force pulling the car to the right. But the banking tilts the car at an angle, meaning the force of its weight isn't going to go straight into the track, but a component of this weight is added to the force pulling the car rightwards. This is why cars can go much faster through banked corners. But this extra force means more resistant force from the track, stressing the tyres more than normal. Michelin of course knew that, and this wasn't the straw that broke the camel's back. No. What had actually happened between the 2004 and 2005 Grand Prix is the track had been resurfaced. And as part of that resurfacing, the track had been diamond ground smooth. Diamond grinding is quite a common practice on roads, though less so in Britain. The practice is actually used to make tarmac safer and more predictable. Tarmac, or asphalt, is a bunch of tiny stones mixed into a syrupy tar that's poured out onto the track to form the track surface. All the mixture of stones, called aggregate, can form a sort of random bumpy texture, thus creating an element of unpredictability in the surface. Diamond grinding is a process by which a vehicle with big old diamond edged blades basically just shaves off a layer from the top, resulting in an even surface. At the same time, this process carves grooved lines into the track longitudinally. Now the longitude direction is with the direction of the circuit, the lateral direction is across the direction of the circuit. 
Diamond ground tracks give improved ride due to being so smooth in the direction of travel, and can improve braking control and have the added effect of providing improved drainage channels in the event of wet weather. In the lateral direction however you can see there is much increased macro texture of the surface, a really obvious toothing in this direction. This means that when turning, the way the circuit resists tyre movement in the lateral direction can be much more acute grabbing the tyre with much more intensity. It was this surface behaviour that Michelin had not been able to anticipate through testing alone, and were ultimately underprepared for. If they raced, there would likely be more tyre failures and, as Ralph Schumacher would attest, you definitely do not want to fly into that concrete wall at hundreds of kilometres an hour. In fact there are plenty of American oval racers that will back that up. So it now came down to compromises. Pretty much all of the teams were keen to find a way to race, even if it meant Michelin teams scoring no points. The goal here was to be able to put on the show fans had come and paid to see. The FIA suggested that Michelin teams just drive slowly through turn 13. This idea was rejected by the teams, as having cars running at significant speed differences through the banking was potentially disastrous. You don't want cars launching off the back of other cars at an oval track. The FIA also suggested using an entirely different spec of tyre, which wasn't possible, and for teams to just change tyres every few laps, which would have been allowed in this case, though shipping that volume of tyres out at a day's notice was logistically not very possible. Michelin and the teams came up with what they thought was a better solution. Install a chicane at turn 13 to force cars to slow down and allow the tyres to survive. They did so, suggesting that Michelin teams themselves not be allowed to score points, or even that the Bridgestone teams be allowed to skip the chicane entirely. The FIA rejected this. One, they thought this was grossly unfair to the Bridgestone teams who had turned up with the correct equipment, and two, the FIA ran by strict safety rules and would not permit any extra corners added to the circuit that had not gone through the thorough inspection and testing process that all Grand Prix circuit changes must go through. Furthermore, the FIA said that if teams or circuit owners even tried to change the circuit in any way, the FIA would withdraw all of their staff from the event, making it a completely unsanctioned affair the FIA would not be held liable for any accidents that come from circuit tampering. It was at this point that the teams and circuit officials actually started to come up with a plan to go through with their chicane idea. Knowing the FIA would withdraw, they started working on how their own staff could take on the equivalent FIA roles in order to run a non-championship race for one day only. The FIA did not like this, and Max Mosley, the president at the time, and a much more hands-on political figure than Jean Tot is today, said that if the Grand Prix went on without the FIA, it would threaten all FIA sanctioned events in the USA. At this point it was pretty much game over, though negotiations continued right up to the start of the race, including drivers pleading over the radio on the formation lap to be allowed to race, the Michelin teams had to withdraw before lights out. They returned to the pits to much fury from the fans in the stands. Afterwards Max Mosley had asked the teams why they simply did not run through the pits every single lap. And this to me is a strange thing to say, the pit lane is a very dangerous place during a normal session, and having 14 cars running through every single lap, some pitting, some not, strikes me as throwing safety to the wind. After being hauled before the FIA, the seven Michelin teams were initially found guilty of failing to turn up with suitable tyres, and wrongfully refusing to start the race. Though both charges were overturned, after the teams reminded the FIA that the great state of Indiana would rightfully go after them on manslaughter charges, if they'd started the race and the worst had happened. Overall it was a very messy weekend that left a bad taste in everyone's mouth. No one looked good, though it had actually been a monumental effort from teams working together and accepting great sacrifice to try and create a solution to go racing. Within a couple of years, Michelin and the Indianapolis Motor Speedway had withdrawn from Formula 1. The one set of tyres per race rule was dropped at the end of the year. The very idea of competing tyre manufacturers allowed in F1 has been left behind. F1 is a different world now, politically and technologically, but the lessons learned in 2005 about both race preparedness and the spirit of competing teams putting aside their arms to work together for the good of the sport has not been forgotten.